Let justice roll down like an ever-flowing stream. I think that verse, taken from the book of the prophet Amos, is familiar to anyone who lived through the civil rights struggle in our own national history, as it was a favorite text of the Reverend Martin Luther King. The text of Amos has been a longtime favorite for all of those engaged in social activism because of all of the minor prophets. Amos stands out as God's voice in behalf of the poor and of the oppressed. There are often many misconceptions that come out of the work of Amos, but Amos' chief concern was that righteousness be present in the land. His concern for justice was not simply a matter of criminal justice proceedings, but rather on the behavior of the people and particularly of the government with respect to interpersonal relationships. When we look at Amos, Amos seems to be somewhat of a grim and unhappy type of prophet who spends so much time talking about the justice of God that we barely get a glimpse of God's mercy in His work. That, in his, uh, Work. That's why today we're going to look briefly at both Amos and Hosea. They're kind of twin prophets of the 8th century B.C., and the accent of Amos is on justice, and the accent of Hosea is on mercy, but it would be uh, incorrect to assume that all that Amos was concerned about was justice, and that all that Hosea was concerned about was mercy. We're just talking here about the difference in emphasis. In the book of Amos, early on in chapter 1, we read this statement. Chapter 1, verse 3, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. And then what follows is a prophetic announcement of God's judgment upon the city of Damascus. And then in verse 6, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Verse 9, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Verse 11, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. And what's going on here is a series of oracles being delivered by Amos by which God, speaking through His prophet, announces His judgment on the wicked nations and cities that surround Israel. Now, I like to imagine this scenario, that Amos is surrounded by his, by his people from Israel. He himself is from the southern kingdom of Judah, but he is prophesying now in the north, and I see him gathering all of these people around him, and he's speaking about God's going to judge Damascus. And when he says, for three transgressions and for four, I will not withhold my punishment on Damascus, the people are roaring and they're cheering. That's great news. And then he says, for three transgressions and four, I'm going to judge Gaza, and the people cheer again. And I'm going to judge Edom, and I'm going to judge this nation and that nation. And we can see a rising crescendo of excitement among the people as the judgment of God is being announced on their pagan neighbors. But then, at the height of their excitement, Amos says, and for three transgressions, and for, O Israel, I will not withhold my punishment from you. And it's as if he sets a trap for his audience as all of a sudden their joy turns to bitter sorrow and hostility against the voice of this prophet. One of the most important themes that we find in Amos has to do with an idea that is deeply rooted in Old Testament religious faith. It predates the prophets, 
and it was the expectation of what was called the day of the Lord. It's sometimes called the day of Yahweh, and other times the day of God's visitation. And in antiquity, the Jewish people longed for that future when God Himself would visit His people and manifest Himself clearly. And, and the people look forward to this with exceeding great joy. It was their eschatological hope, to be sure. In fact, when we come to the New Testament and we remember the annunciation by the angel Gabriel, not in this case to Mary, but to Zacharias of the impending birth of John the Baptist, that when under the influence of the Holy Spirit, Zacharias sings the Benedictus, he mentions in his song of praise his great joy, for God was visiting His people, and that they look forward to this day of visitation. But as I said, in the tradition, the day of the Lord that was anticipated was a time of the visiting of God's mercy and grace and of salvation. But let's take a look briefly at what Amos does with this uh, favorite hope of the people. In chapter 5, verse 16, Amos says this, Therefore the Lord God of hosts, the Lord, says this, There shall be wailing in the streets, and they shall all say in the highways, Alas, alas, they shall call the farmer to mourning, the skillful lamenters to wailing, and in all the vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through you, says the Lord. Not I will pass over you, as He did in Egypt, but I will pass through you. And then He gives this oracle of doom. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as though he went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? Other translations read as follows. It is a day of darkness. There is no light in it. This is the most pessimistic presentation of the concept of the day of the Lord that we find anywhere in the Old Testament. For Amos, he said, woe to you who are eagerly awaiting and desiring the day of the Lord's visitation, because what you are looking forward to in joyful anticipation is going to be a tremendous surprise to you. You will be like people who are fleeing from a lion, and just as you think that you've escaped the lion, you run headfirst into a bear. And you run from the bear, and you rush back to the safety and sanctuary of your house. You run inside the house, close the door, breathe a sigh of relief, lean your hand against the wall, and a poisonous snake bites you. That's the imagery that he uses to these people. And he's speaking now about the coming judgment upon Jerusalem. Now, we will see in a few moments that Hosea tempers the idea of the judgment that is now associated with the day of the Lord and holds out a future hope for the remnant of Israel for whom the day of the Lord will be a blessing. And if we would follow this theme throughout the prophets, Isaiah, Zephaniah, for example, Joel, and into the New Testament, we will see that the day of the Lord becomes a concept that's very important to biblical theology that is a double-edged sword. For those who are not prepared for the coming of the Lord, it is a day of darkness with no light in it. But for those who are eagerly awaiting His coming 
and his appearance. For them, it is a time of unparalleled blessing and of grace. In the New Testament, the incarnation of Jesus is described variously by the term visitation. But even there, his visit to this world is a time of exceeding great joy for those who are faithful to the covenant and who welcome his coming. But his coming is also a crisis because it brings judgment upon those who reject him. He comes to his own and his own receive him not. And even in the latter days of his ministry, he laments on Palm Sunday over the city of Jerusalem. And he tells them that destruction will come upon the city because they were not ready in their day of visitation. Now, Amos, as I say, being from the south, incurs the wrath of those who live in the northern kingdom, the priests of Bethel, Amaziah, accused Amos of being in a conspiracy against Israel. And he says in chapter 7, verse 10, the land is not able to bear all his words. And in verse 12, Amaziah says to Amos, go you seer or you prophet, Flee to the land of Judah, eat your bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and is the royal residence. And Amos answers Amaziah with some strange words, but I think they're important to understand this book. Amos answered and said, I am not a prophet, nor a son of a prophet. But I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now, what's going on here is that Amos denies that he's a prophet. And yet here he is celebrated as one of the most important canonical prophets of the Old Testament. Why would he announce publicly to the priest of Bethel that he's not a prophet? I am not a prophet. I'm not a son of a prophet. Well, the word that he uses here in the Hebrew is the word nabi. And a nabi was, made reference to, that's why this translation that I read from today uh, translates it seer. In Israel, there were, in addition to the canonical prophets, those who were charismatically endowed by God to be agents of divine revelation, to be His spokesman to the nation. There were also professional prophets, institutional prophets, cultic prophets who were prophets for hire. And when Amaziah rejects Amos, he is calling him a run-of-the-mill, cultic, professional seer. He said, go practice your trade somewhere else. And Amos is saying, I'm not that kind of a prophet. I'm not a prophet with a little p. I'm a prophet with a capital P. I am speaking the word of the Lord. And so I hope that explains this uh, enigmatic portion. Then we read that, uh, that God is going to bring the judgment upon the people, and He says earlier in chapter 7, God showed Amos a plumb line. And the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of My people Israel, and I will not pass by them anymore. This plumb line is one of several visions. There's the vision of fire, there's the vision of, of the basket of summer fruit, and so on, which illustrates a common thing that we find in the prophets. The prophets are noted for giving object lessons, strange behavioral patterns, that they exhibit the truth of God through running through the streets naked, or Ezekiel lying on his side for many months, and in this case, having visions that have symbolic meaning 
to the people that communicate the Word of God. And all of these visions that we find here in chapter 7 and 8 have to do with uh, uh, the visions of the coming judgment of God upon the people. Now, in the book of Amos, I'll finish with this, as I said, the central motif is about social righteousness. Because what God is concerned about in Israel is immorality, social injustice, and religious apostasy. So that God says to the people, I despise your feasts, I abhor your solemn assemblies, your sacrifices have become a stench in my nostrils, because though you have the outward trappings of religion, you are treating each other in an oppressive way. For the poor are sold for a pair of shoes. And then he turns his attention to the wealthy class of people who for the most part were in the controlling government of the time and says that the women have become like the fatted cows of Bashan. Now imagine a prophet saying that today in a congregation, standing up to the wealthy ladies in the, in the church and say, you fatted cows of Bashan, you recline on, on uh, beds of ivory, and yet you sell the poor for a pair of shoes, and there is no justice in the gates. And when he talks about justice in the gates, he's talking about the court system that is supposed to be impartial and give no partiality either to the poor or to the rich. And what is happening now is that the judges are accepting bribes and they are distorting the principles of the law of God that were a part of His covenant. Now, as I said, the prophet Amos emphasizes this concern of social righteousness Hosea, his counterpart in these days, is perhaps most famous to us because of the situation that takes place at the beginning of the book that bears his name, where Hosea is chosen by God and commanded to go out and marry a harlot, presumably a professional prostitute. And let's look at this uh, narrative that we find at the beginning of the book of Hosea, where in the first chapter, verse 2, we read, The Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. Now this is important. As I said, the prophets constantly used object lessons. And here was the supreme object lesson that God was trying to, to demonstrate to His people by telling Hosea to marry a prostitute. The reason for it is obvious, because is, my people have become a harlot. My bride has been unfaithful to me, and yet I have stayed married to this bride for so long, and I have tolerated and have been patient with her infidelities. But now the time of judgment is at hand. And so we read on in, in the first chapter, so Hosea went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And God said, call his name Jezreel. For in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu, and I will bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel." Again, predicting the military defeat of Israel that will take place in the valley of Jezreel. And so the firstborn son of Hosea is given a name that communicates and embodies the prophecy of God. Then he goes on to say that his wife conceived again and bore a daughter, and God said to him, Call her name Lo Ruhamah, for I will no longer have mercy 
on the house of Israel. The name means no more mercy. What's your name, little girl? My name is no more mercy. God gave me that name because he has said to his people and to his unfaithful bride, I will forbear no longer and give no more mercy. But the deepest poignancy of this protracted object lesson, I believe, is with the birth of the third child. Now, when she had weaned Lo Ruhamah, she conceived and bore a son. And God said, Call his name Lo Ami, which being translated means not my people. And God is saying to Israel, You who I called to be my covenant people, you whom I married in the wilderness, and I said that you would be a light to the Gentiles, I would be your God, and you would be my people, and I set you apart and consecrated you to be a holy nation. No more. Now you are to me lo ami, not my people. It's fascinating that in the New Testament when the apostles speak of the ingrafting of Gentiles such as ourselves into the church and into the kingdom of God, it is said of us that God took a people who were no people and made us His people. But that does not mean that God's rejection of His covenant people at this point in history was full or final. As I said, Hosea is the prophet of hope and of mercy. So far there's been precious little hope and precious little mercy in this text. He, in chapter 2, uh, God commands Hosea to divorce Gomer. Again, to symbolize God's divorce decree against Israel. But then in chapter 2, verses 14, we read as follows, Therefore, behold, I will allure her, I will bring her into the wilderness, and I will speak comfort to her. I will give her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor is a door of hope, and she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer my master. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And then in verse 23, And I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy, and I will say to those who were not my people, Ami, my people. Once again, God will restore His bride to Himself and call His people by His name.